Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Katie Peace, and I'm the Director of Communications for the Preservation League of New York State. We are so glad to have you with us for this webinar this afternoon. Um, first off, if anyone needs or wants closed captioning, you can enable that by using the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Transcription is enabled for this webinar, so if you want those captions, you can do that. Um, if you've made your way to this webinar without being familiar with the League, um, if you've come to us through Docomomo or um, are just a fan of Alexandra Lang, I am thrilled to introduce you to the League today. We are a New York statewide nonprofit focused on investing in people and projects that champion the essential role of preservation in community re revitalization, sustainable economic growth, and the protection of our historic buildings and landscapes. The League works in every corner of New York State in lots of different ways. We offer technical services, grant programs, our seven to save list of endangered historic sites, our Excellence in Historic Preservation Award, celebrating the very best in our field throughout New York State. We do public policy and advocacy work at the local, state, and federal levels. And we have a whole slate of online programs, everything ranging from historic tax credits, barn preservation, to more general interest things like what we are here today to talk about. And so we're really excited to welcome Alexandra Lang to do an author talk for us as part of our preservation book club. Many thanks to the Gary Trust for underwriting that program for us. Alexandra is a design critic. Her essays, reviews, and profiles have appeared in many different publications from Architect, the Harvard Design Magazine, The Atlantic, The New Yorker, and The New York Times. She's a columnist for City Lab. She's been featured by Design Observer, Design, and Curbed. Um, her previous book, which is still on my TBR, I need to get that <laughs> need to get that read one of these days, The Design of Childhood, How the Material World Shapes Independent Kids, was published in 2018. Um, and today we're going to be talking about her newest book, which was published just last year, 2022, Meet Me by the Fountain, an inside history of the mall. Um, I was extremely interested in this book when I first heard about it. I thought it was just such an interesting subject matter, something that I hadn't really considered a, in an academic or intellectual way. Um, but it's something that I think is a really common denominator for so many people, especially anyone who um, came of age in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, the mall is something that everyone can relate to in some way. Everyone has some kind of history with the mall. Um, and so I was really eager to read this and I was very excited that uh, Alexandra was, was game to do this author talk for us. Um, so Meet Me by the Fountain is a really interesting deep dive into the mall as a cultural place, as an architectural type and kind of the past, present and future of what the mall is and could be. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people talk about dead malls and that's <laughs> that's definitely part of the story. Um, but I, I loved how Alexander kind of dug into the human aspect of malls and, and how we can kind of rethink what they could be and how they can serve their communities even if they are no longer shopping centers. So. We're excited to talk to her about that today. And whether you've read the book or not, I think you're going to get a lot out of today's presentation. And we're really excited that um, Liz Wakegus, the executive director of Docomomo US, is joining us to facilitate the conversation with Alexandra following her presentation. Um, Liz has been at Docomomo for 10 years. She has developed new programming, including their national symposium, which is coming up this year in New Haven. So, you know, register for that when you can. Um, and their Modernism in America Awards. She uh, leads their advocacy efforts and um, spearheads the efforts. She spearheaded the efforts to landmark the Ambassador Grill and the AT&T building in New York City. Um, last year, Docomomo listed shopping malls as their theme for 2022. So when I was putting this together, I was like, Liz is going to be the perfect person to do this for us. And I was very excited that she was willing and able to join us today as well. Uh, before we hand it over to Alexandra for her presentation, I wanted to just do a couple of housekeeping notes for everyone. If you have questions during any portion of this webinar, please drop them in the Q&A box. The chat will be open for general comments, questions. I'll drop links when I can. Um, this webinar is being recorded as well, so if you can't stay for the whole thing or if you just really love it and you want to send it to all your friends after the fact, you can find it on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. And please do tell all of your friends. Um, and then one other thing is just, I would love to know where you're coming from today. I would love to know what the mall of your childhood was, or if there's a mall that you just really love going to today. So um, I was a Roosevelt Field child on Long Island, and uh, I would love to know what malls shaped your lives as well. So drop that in the chat if you can. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Alexandra. Great. Um, hi, everyone, and thanks so much, Katie, for that great introduction. I have to say that in 
researching and then writing this book, the you know number one thing people wanted to talk to me about was their mall. So that is a great thing to chime in with in the chat. So I am going to share my screen so that you guys can see some malls. Um, I hope everyone can see that. Um, so uh, yeah. So my book, Meet Me by the Fountain, um, was published in June 2022, and it covers the history of indoor shopping malls from the 1950s to the present day. Um, and each chapter in the book really covers a decade in the life of malls, from their in invention to their kind of flourishing to their demolition. And then in the last chapters, I start to suggest a number of ideas about how to repurpose malls for the future. Um, and for this audience, you know, kind of a preservationist audience, I really want to suggest that my book can serve two purposes. Um, first, to historicize the mall. As Katie mentioned, a lot of people don't really think of the mall as having a history, um, but malls are now more than 70 years old, so well within the preservation window. And malls are and were designed by many of the same amazing architects who designed the houses, museums, and public buildings that already dot the National Register and other kinds of um, landmark lists. Um, and secondly, while adaptive reuse has long been applied to former industrial buildings, you know, since the 70s, often by the same architects who designed shopping malls, Today, we have fewer of those large open plan structures that are seeking new uses, but we have many more malls in a vacant state. And I really think that malls like those brick factories, um, they're also large open plan, top lit masonry structures. And once you strip away a lot of the retail cruft, like the signage, the, the seating, the benches, um, we should all really be considering malls a repository of already built space in suburbs that are increasingly urban and increasingly built up. So that's kind of my pitch for thinking about malls differently. Uh, so I first had the idea for this book back in 2018 when I read about the architect Renzo Piano's involvement with City Center Bishop Ranch in San Ramon, California. The word city center are in the name of this project, but when I looked up where it was on the map, it didn't really seem to be close to any cities. It's kind of in the outer reaches of the Bay Area. And Piano himself kept talking about the central space at the mall as a piazza. But this was not an Italian hill town. And I suspected, and my research later proved, that this was, in fact, a mall. So why did no one want to call it a mall? Cut to almost four years later, and a book that answers that question, I hope, um, in part by linking malls to the fashion cycle. Once the defining news narrative of mall of shopping centers became dead malls post the 2007 recession, developers wanted to distance themselves from the word mall, um, if not from the architectural typology of shopping around a central open space in the suburbs. Um, but I found during my research that hundreds of malls were still alive and well, though approximately an equal number, some 700 to 800, were in the process of dying off. But yet, as I write in the book, mall architecture was really made for malleability. Unlike lots of other architectural types, the mall is really a framework for its anchor tenants and boutiques and food counters um, and kiosks to swap in and out easily. The mall exterior, which is typically blank, is kind of timeless and easily updated with new signage. So it seemed to me that by burrowing into the past of the mall, um, talking about its best designers, its original intentions, and its 70-year legacy, I could help both the mall lovers and the mall haters figure out what to do with these really ubiquitous structures. So for the rest of my presentation today, I'm going to take you through some architectural highlights of the history of the mall. And after that, um, Liz and I will chat and she will kind of incorporate any questions that you have and that you put in the Q&A. So there are many states that can claim credit for the, being originators at the mall. And California can make a great argument for that. Um, the California mall story begins in Westchester, which was then a new aerospace industry suburb of Los Angeles, 
um, with the design of this freestanding department store. The man typically, and I think correctly credited with inventing the shopping mall was Victor Gruen. Um, born in Vienna, Gruen fled the Nazis and emigrated to New York in 1938. His first job in the US was working for the industrial designer Norman Bel Geddes on what would become the Futurama Pavilion for General Motors at the 1939 World's Fair in New York City. So I think that pavilion is really important for the mall story for two reasons. First, it housed a 35,000 square foot model of what the USA would look like in the year 1960. But this was a model because it was made for General Motors that included downtown skyscrapers, suburban housing, 14 lane highways, and a heck of a lot of cars. So, and two, the exterior of the pavilion, which you can kind of see here, was designed as a streamlined object itself, with long snaking up the exterior and guiding crowds into the building. When a decade later, Gruen and his first wife, the designer Elsie Crummick, were asked to design a freestanding department store for Westchester, they were obviously thinking back to this World's Fair experience in terms of how to choreograph the crowds and choreograph the cars. Milleron's was a mid-priced department store, and it was really ahead of the curve in realizing that the market for their wares was moving out of traditional downtowns. All the women living in those new little single family houses were going to need a place to shop. But while they had arrived at the downtown department stores by streetcar and bus, these new stores were only accessible by car. But rather than surrounding their brand new store with even more parking lot, Gruen and Crummick turned part of the parking lot into a promenade. Drivers accessed the top floor entrance to the store via the dramatic crisscrossing ramps that you saw in the previous slide, um, and they parked on the roof. And up on the roof, there was also a nursery where you could drop off your children, and a restaurant that had a view over the surrounding low-rise suburb. And then at street level, which you can see here, they created a series of display windows that were set at an angle so that the displays could be seen both by pedestrians walking by on the sidewalk and by cars speeding past on the roadway. And um, as you see in another move that you know kind of became part of the mall model, the outside is otherwise pretty plain, except for that giant Milleron's logo. As you can probably recognize, the giant logo became um, the choice for department stores attached to shopping malls, solid boxes with this big logo at a highway scale, which and I always think of them as kind of a giant version of the shopping bags that you would hopefully be walking out of the store carrying. Milleron's, however, was only one building and one business. Uh, a few years after that store, Bruin was contacted by the Dayton family of Minneapolis. Their department store Dayton's was a traditional downtown anchor store, but by the early 1950s, they had begun to see a downturn in their business. Like the department store owners in many other cities, including Hudson's in Detroit and Neiman Marcus in Dallas, they realized that they were going to have to open stores in the suburbs, but they wanted to exert design control over their surroundings. And that's where Gruen came in, offering advanced modern design with a European sensibility and the design for the shopping mall, which was centered on a plaza that was supposed to remind shoppers of a main street or a town square, or in Gruen's mind, the bustling streets of Vienna. You can see um, his design here and an aerial view with the black skylight over the central plaza, which was bracketed by two department stores and two bands of ind individual shops. So the mall was a big improvement on the traditional town square, however, because as the advanced press for Southdale stated, the mall offered, quote, 365 shopping days a year in climate controlled comfort in a state that was known for deep winter snows and pretty unpleasant summer humidity. The central open space at uh, Southdale to kind of underline this idea of every day being a perfect shopping day uh, was known as the Garden of Perpetual Spring, and it featured plants and fountains 
a carousel, an aviary, which is that cylindrical structure that you can see in this photo, and two sculptures by Harry Bertoia that are still in place today known as the Golden Trees. Southdale was a huge hit, kind of a national phenomenon. Um, the press covered the opening as a major suburban breakthrough, and Gruen Associates, which by then um, was headquartered in Los Angeles, uh, soon had more work than they could really handle. Over time, the design of the mall would mature, and the pinwheel plan that Gruen used for Southdale would get discarded. Um, the simplest version and the most replicated version of the uh, late 1950s, early mall plans were shaped like a capital I with one department store at either end and then shops lining the sides of um, a middle that was had planters and benches down the center. But this simple version could also be dressed up. And throughout the 1960s, some of the country's best architects experimented with the mall as an architectural type and a place that could be kind of gussied up or, or downplayed depending on the materials that you built it with. A great example of this is North Park Center in Dallas, which was built in 1964 by the developers Ray and Patsy Nasher and is still owned by their daughter Nancy, one of very few malls that is still under family ownership. Um, this mall was originally L-shaped with one department store at each end and then one at the corner. And the Neiman Marcus, which was the marquee department store there, was designed by um, Aeros, the, the partners of Aero Saren and Kevin Roach and John Dinkaloo. Um, and the, the sort of uh, half circles that you can see protruding from the outside in this photo were actually the dressing rooms. Um, so each one of those little half circles has a skylight on the top so people could uh, try on clothes and see what they looked like in daylight. Architect E.G. Hamilton, who designed the rest of the mall, um, designed it to have a very elegant and minimalist structure with um, custom white brick, polished concrete floors, and a little flower-shaped bug, which you can kind of see at an angle in this photo, in the corner of the frame of every storefront. Um, so stores could come and go, but the architecture would remain the same. And really, it has. Um, if you go to North Park today, it still looks totally up to date and beautiful thanks to careful maintenance. And so much so that when the mall doubled in size in 2006, the new architects from the same firm repeated and updated the original style. Um, some materials changed like the ability to have glass railings um, and some long unsupported bridges over the second story of shops. But the white brick, the concrete, and those little corner pieces all stayed the same and were re replicated um, you know, 50 years after the mall opened. A grander model for the mall that um, came into fashion starting in 1970 were the arcades and gallerias that sprang up in the mid 19th century in both Europe and the United States. Um, the granddaddy of all of the gallerias is the Galleria Vittorio Emanuele in Milan, which gave its name and its form to dozens of malls with long barrel vaulted glass roofs. The first of these copycat gallerias was the Houston Galleria, which was developed by the visionary developer Gerald Hines and designed by Gyo Obata of HOK. Hines saw Post Oak, which was the area that the Galleria was built in, as the node of a new urban center. Um, and the Galleria, which also pioneered the indoor ice skating rink at shopping malls, was anchored by two department stores, including a Neiman Marcus, which you can see here, with a design inspired by Le Corbusier's La Tourette. It also anchored a mixed use development that included hotels, housing, offices, and a sports club that had a track of, on the roof of the mall going all the way around the skylight. When we talk about the history of architecture and design, we usually focus on the designer as the author of the work. But I think that dialogue is a little bit different when it comes to malls. Victor Gruen was trained as an architect and he worked as a designer during the early part of his career. But once malls took off as a concept, his role became more of a salesman. 
Um, he had a partner named Larry Smith, who was an economist, and they worked really hard to make financial arguments for malls that would appeal to civic leaders, bankers, and real estate people. And there are a number of charismatic developers that are part of the mall story, from the Nashers in Dallas, um, to Gerald Hines in Texas, to James Rouse, who we'll get to in a little bit, in Baltimore and beyond. Hines began his career as an office tower developer, but in projects like um, the Galleria in Houston and then the subsequent one in Dallas, he expanded his scope to city making and put malls at the center of new mixed use neighborhoods. Um, you can see one of his tools of persuasion here. This is a brochure that he showed around to other potential investors before the design for the Galleria was finalized, because you can see there's no barrel vaulted glass roof um, in this rendering. Um, what, what interests me about this brochure is that it really treats Post Oak as if it were already a place. Um, it was not a particularly developed area um, in the late 1960s um, and definitely like not at the kind of class level that this brochure seems to indicate. Um, and it also shows the Galleria as a kind of theme park of life where everything is taken care of and everything is fun. It's like a mall utopia with ice skaters and a carousel and fancy circus banners. So these Gallerias created a bridge between the past and the present. Many of the new Galleria-shaped shopping malls were built into existing cities like their 19th century models. And the Galleria form becomes the look of choice for developers and architects who are trying to make downtown shopping competitive again. Westside Fashion Square in Los Angeles is an example of this style of mall and was highly effectively used as an interior setting in the movie Clueless. Um, in the chapter, one chapter of my, my book, I talk a lot about teen movies and how the mall figures in so many classics. Um, and I talk about how mall atriums are essentially catwalks. And this scene in which Sharon Christian ascend towards the glass roof of the mall on an escalator like mall royalty really underlines that point for me. And I think this movie uses the architecture extremely well uh, to um, kind of set up the various uh, kind of class and clique divisions among the different kids. By the early 1980s, the suburban mall formula of shopping plus a pinch of entertainment like the carousel or the skating rink needed an upgrade. Stores alone were no longer worth the trip for a lot of people. And this is where another Los Angeles-based architect named John Jurdy comes in. Jerdy, who had built a fair number of cookie cutter malls, including the Glendale Galleria, thought that the entertainment part of the mall should be in the foreground rather than the background. He didn't want any of the tasteful Euro style of the Gallerias. He thought malls should be fun and they should look fun. His first attempt at this was Horton Plaza in San Diego, an indoor outdoor mall that was built in that city's historic downtown and designed to resemble a Hollywood version of an Italian hill town with striped palazzo built like buildings like Siena and lots of level changes. But Jerdy took this idea of the mall as entertainment further with the Mall of America, which was for some time the largest mall in the United States. Um, the Mall of America centered on an actual amusement park and had four wings themed like different world cities. The idea was that you could have chills and thrills for the kids and then a taste of sophistication for the adults, again, all under one climate controlled roof. All of this shopping was there. Um, the original Mall of America had four department stores and two levels of specialty shops, but there was also enough to do over all the square footage of the mall that you could fly to Minneapolis for the weekend and never leave its indoor confines. And people actually did this. There were direct flights from all over America to the Minneapolis airport for people to just spend the weekend at the mall. With its green metal roof and indoor street lamps, West Market Street, which you see here, was supposed to look like a European market with stalls on the ground floor selling food and handmade gifts like an authentic, quote unquote, brick lined street. 
The developers of the Mall of America Triple Five Group had previously opened the West Edmonton Mall in Alberta, which had an even more extravagant theme, um, including a replica of one of Columbus's ships. It makes me a little sad today to see that some of Triple Five's more recent projects, including American Dream in New Jersey, um, are so much less themed and more kind of generically luxurious on the inside with acres of white marble and stainless steel railings. Even the Mall of America doesn't really look like this anymore. And I have a lot of nostalgia for the kind of texture and colors and faux garden district look of parts of the original Mall of America. One of Dirty's most important insights, which had been part of Gruen's original mall pitch, um, was that you had to have something for the kids. Um, he took it a step further than a nursery or a McDonald's play area. The Mall of America had this entire theme park, originally Camp Snoopy, in the center with restaurants arranged around the central atrium and overlooking the roller coaster. It was kind of like the state fair happened every day or a trip to Disney World without leaving the state. And as malls start to reposition themselves in the 21st century, entertainment has again become a major driver of new developments. Um, you know, fancy movie theaters with food, VR experiences, trampoline parks, climbing walls, all of these things are being put into malls or being replacing department stores in many malls because they are more better draws for the whole family than shopping is at this point. In adding a Market Street to Mall of America, Jerdy was also following another trend in mall design, which was the return to downtown. The proliferation of malls in the 1960s and early 70s um, had, as downtown mar merchants feared, siphoned many shoppers off to the suburbs. And so those department store owners found themselves with grand old buildings that were empty, and city leaders found themselves with dense walkable streets that were also empty. At this point, the developer James Rouse enters. Um, he had built a number of classic shopping malls around Baltimore in the late 50s and early 1960s, but he thought that some of those suburban shoppers, along with tourists and office workers, could be enticed to shop downtown if it offered an experience that could only be had downtown. Um, and that experience include open air pedestrian walks, real old architecture, and lots of local businesses. People had to be kind of reintroduced to what was special about their city, but it needed to be packaged in an appealing way. Um, what he and the designers Ben and Jane Thompson came up with was came to be called the Festival Marketplace. And it was industrial architecture transformed uh, via adaptive reuse into a new kind of shopping district. Um, and he was super successful for a time, first at Faneuil Hall in Boston, then at Baltimore's Harbor Place, and then at Manhattan's South Street Seaport and Pier 17. Here's um, an interior photo of Faneuil Hall. And I hope you can see how the colors and materials and textures are really different from the interior of a typical shopping mall. It's warm instead of cold with these this festival-like yellow fabric roofing, and there are open stalls instead of individual boutiques and brick paving. And one thing that the Thompsons really emphasized was that nothing should be wrapped in plastic. You were supposed to be able to touch everything and kind of see it free of packaging. Calvin Trillin would eventually write a satire of such places in The New Yorker, because the brick and the kitchenware stores also became a cliche. But for people who were used to shopping in fluorescent lit linoleum floor plastic wrap places, initially Faneuil Hall was really a revelation. A number of top of the profession architects designed malls at this time, from Ben Thompson, who was at one time the head of the architecture program at Harvard's Graduate School of Design, to Gyo Obata, who designed the Galleria, but also the Air and Space Museum in Washington. Um, and others you might have heard of include the Office of Aero Saarinen, I.M. Pei, who designed Roosevelt Field, and Cesar Pelli, who designed the Winter Garden at the World Financial Center. But 
This interest in the mall by the upper echelons of the profession kind of started to peter out in the 70s and 80s as malls became more ubiquitous. Architects started to be afraid of commerce and that it would somehow taint their practice to design something commercial. John Jurdy, who really loved the retail side of things, often talked about he, how he couldn't get respect. And when people talk about innovations in architecture after World War II, they're much more likely to talk about the airports that built suburbs like Westchester than they are the department stores and shopping malls that serve the people living in those suburbs. It may interest you to know that Frank Gehry even designed a shopping mall um, for James Rouse. Uh, Santa Monica Place opened on 3rd Street in Santa Monica and was basically the West Coast version of Spaniel Hall, white and beachy instead of industrial and brick, and asymmetrical and metallic instead of warm and axial. Gary designed this mall during the same period in which he was working on his famous house. And you can see some of the same materials like the chain link fence on the parking garage with its giant super graphic and the angles and indoor plants inside the mall. Ultimately, Gary was unhappy with this, with this project because his vision clashed with some of the commercial imperatives. And after this, he swore he wouldn't do any more retail projects and rebuilt his career as an art architect. But I, when I read that part of his biography, I just thought, why did he feel like he had to choose? Like, why do we make um, art and commerce um, so antithetical? So the last chapter of my book is devoted to the mall today. Um, and this was a chapter that incorporated a bunch of my previous reporting, in particular two pieces I wrote for Curved, one on Hudson Yards, um, and the other on the surprisingly large number of new malls in New York City, you know, built over the past five to 10 years, um, which include things in my mind like Essex Market. So projects like Essex Market, which is in lower Manhattan and opened in 2019, might look a little bit different in materials, but are really based on the same ideas that Rouse and the Thompsons brought to cities, taking the local and historical um, and putting it into a more highly designed, more centralized, and easier to use context. I think you can see in their textured ceiling, which follows the line of the seats in the movie theater that's stacked above it, an echo of the coffers in places like the Dome at Faneuil Hall and other 1970s adaptive reuse projects. In the best case scenario, projects like these allow local merchants to thrive, and can incubate new businesses and can serve both neighbors and tourists. I would say in the worst case scenario, these fifth up markets prove to be too expensive for longtime vendors and their upscale aesthetics can turn away less well-heeled well customers. The part of my final chapter that seems to resonate for many people um, is the section on adaptive reuse and particularly this project, uh, Austin Community College. Highland Campus, which uses all of the parts of a dead mall, Highland Mall, which opened in Austin in 1970 and was the city's first indoor mall, and has built a number of new structures, including new green spaces and new housing in the parking lot. Where once malls were put into industrial buildings, now we can see schools, offices, churches, and markets put into dead malls. According to the college's chancellor, students' positive associations with the mall actually helps them to feel comfortable on campus, and the college saved a giant fiberglass hot dog that was part of the original food court, and that has become an import, a fun photo op for um, kids at the college. So um, to wrap up, this is where I hope it becomes clear that I was not writing the history of malls as a pure nostalgia play. I really want everyone to take on the knowledge about how malls are and were well designed and are and were important community spaces. Um, and armed with that knowledge, I feel like everyone should be better able to consider what might be done with possibly the dead mall in their town. Um, I really think malls should be thought about with the same creativity and excitement that festival marketplaces once generated. 
Um, there are a lot more stories to be written about malls, and I feel like the ones that are in my book are just the start. Um, so thank you very much for listening. And now I am happy to chat with Liz and take questions. I will stop my screen share. Right. Hi. Hey there, Alexandra. That was great. It's like everything about malls in 30 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and so much more. And I, I think it's uh, fitting for you and I to sort of be ending. Of course, I turn on my sound and the fire trucks are going by. Oh. Uh, that you and I are talking about shopping malls because I can remember probably over two years ago, you sent me, you know, you called me or sent me an email and said, I'm thinking about writing this book on shopping malls. Will anyone be interested in it? <laughs> And, you know, I'm, I, I think I, you know, I'd like to think that I was like, yes, of course. And I'm sure that's what I said to you, but. Because you're a supportive friend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, uh, well, two things. One, I was super jealous of the Snoopy in the Mall of America because Albany didn't have a Snoopy, but we have a nipper. So... I want, you know, whoever is here from upstate, we need a, a nipper in the middle of, I guess, Crossgates Mall. That's the, the main mall. Um, but, you know, you sort of touched on this at the end, and it, it really is what I come back to as a preservationist of, you know, the thing that I loved about the book is that you helped me right? When you said, should we do malls? And I was like, yeah, of course we should. Um, but I, I don't know if even I was um, coming at it from a, a design perspective. And I think that's what the book was really helpful of understanding how the spaces were well considered um, and well designed that we're not just talking about architects, but all of the people involved. And yet there is still this negativity, um, which is not much different from a lot of the architecture that I advocate for of the 20th century, brutalism or um, postmodernism. So can you expand on that a little bit about how, how, should we, how should we approach looking at shopping malls, like through, through our, new, our new lens, our new Alexandra Lang, lens. Yeah. Well, I, one of the things I tried to do with the book was to provide kind of a lot of different paths in because I really think it's very audience dependent. Like how, how can you convince people that malls are important? Like you have to know your audience. I mean, I, I knew going into this that, you know, part of the reason malls hadn't been taken seriously is because they, you know, are considered commercial, but also I think because they were always designed to be spaces for women. And I think we can see across like all different branches of architecture that spaces for women and also spaces for children, which I've also written about, um, are never taken as seriously in the historical record as, you know, places of business that would have been largely male dominated until recent times. So like the, the first prejudice to get over is just that like, can, like, can a shopping space be well designed? And I think if people think back to the department stores of the early 20th century, those have kind of already been accepted as, um, you know, cathedrals of commerce and are considered beautiful. So you have to see like the march of history moving forward that once you get enough distance from something, you can start to see it as historical and have, as beautiful. But in terms of malls, I think a lot of my argument started to be about their cultural importance, like what they did for the suburbs. Um, you know, like I have a thought experiment, like imagine the suburbs without malls, like where would women and children have gone during the day? Like where would what women have done their shopping? Where would they have met their friends? Like the suburbs actually don't really work without the mall. And so once you start to see it as that kind of tool and as just as an important a part of the post-war American narrative as, you know, the single family homes and places like Levittown or the highways, you know, built um, during the, with the Federal Highway Act money, then it's like, okay, how, like, how could we possibly ignore them? They are clearly very important. 
Um, and I know that one thing that you all tried to do when malls was the Daco Momo theme was collect a lot of people's personal histories of mall because that that's kind of like the final layer is is like not only were they kind of important spatially important economically but they're also just important emotionally to people like this is an architecture that almost everyone does feel comfortable and does have a story about in a way that I think a lot of other building types just don't have that kind of like one-to-one -one correspondence. Yeah, that was um, by far the most rewarding part of our past year of focusing on shopping malls was um, that everyone has a relationship. Well, maybe not everyone, but most people have a personal relationship with a mall. Everyone has a mall story. And as preservationists, we tend to uh you know uh go towards topics that are a little maybe more academic or subject matter that um people might feel intimidated in engaging with um and for Dokomomo, we are always looking to expand that tent um and get people talking about the built environment so talking about shopping malls really opened up a lot of a lot of doors hopefully in getting people to Think about the built environment, think about the malls, talk about preservation, even if we're not necessarily talking about um, historic preservation, but reuse, um, continued use, who they're for, you know, where have our civic centers gone if these malls are no longer in use? Yeah, I mean, I think that was something that was really important for me. And then I saw like, in stories about malls you know all throughout their history it was just that feeling that you know you know Gruen was this great salesman of the mall and he says you know like I'm going to make you a new town square and a lot of times when architects say something like that it's kind of bs but in fact like that is what sorry architects no um that is what malls became like if you talk to people about growing up in x town they're like oh yeah you know on friday night everyone went to you know x mall and it's always like the names of them are also always built on the template that grew and also created you know like south gate south square like my my mother read my book and was like it's too confusing with all these mall names they all sound the same and i'm like well i'm sorry but like that's that was kind of on purpose um, but so it means that that they did kind of integrate themselves into communities in the way that Bruin foretold. And so it, if you try to remove them, it, you know, it makes the community worse. There tend not to be alternatives. Like we don't have kind of redundant civic institutions in a lot of places. And so, um, you know, especially now, I think coming out of the pandemic, people want to get back out there and like one space that many people actually like do want to occupy again is malls and other like places like it where you can walk around and get food and do a little shopping and run into people that you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I'm going to um, switch over here to um, the Q&A. We have some good questions coming in. Okay. Um, so the first one is from Ron Roth, who asks, what is the state of the festival marketplaces today and are they still viable? Uh, the festival marketplaces are a hard case. The, the original festival marketplaces are not in good shape. Like the, the Rouse ones, um, the really went downhill um, starting about like 10 to 15 years ago when new ownership came in and stopped curating them to the same degree that that Rouse and the Thompsons really wanted them to be. Um, so for example, Faneuil Hall in Boston became really just like a tourist trap with lots of souvenir stores and chain restaurants. So it, it didn't keep the specialness that it originally had. Um, South Street Seaport has undergone like a number of renovations, but the Ben Thompson era buildings there have been replaced um, but in some cases, the new buildings, there's one by shop um, on the pier, like it's also a food marketplace. It's just styled differently. So I think the DNA of the festival marketplace is in places um, like Pier 17 and in places like Essex Market. Um, and it always bugs me when the new architects won't acknowledge that. Um, but 
they, again, as with the mall, they kind of try to rebrand and put new materials on it. So I think that the ideas of the festival marketplace are still very viable, but the actual physical plants of all of those festival marketplaces um, are either no longer with us or likely to be heavily, heavily renovated. Right. Um, and I know it's a little different, but um, I saw Joy um, was said something in the chat about how she had just visited Essex Market in lower Manhattan. I, I went in there for the first time I had to pick up a pie for Thanksgiving. And um, I had no idea that it was there and I walked through and then I bought probably too much cheese um, <laughs> on my way out. See, I feel like Ben Thompson would approve of that. Yeah, I actually think that the upper level of Essex Market is very lively. And you know, if ever, anyone's thinking of going there, it actually has a great um, sort of mezzanine seating level under that high ceiling. Um, that has outlets that's free that anyone can sit in. And I've been there and I've seen, you know, like school kids after school hanging out there and getting bubble tea, which is a very mall activity. There's a lower level below it that's still, um, I think, struggling and like doesn't have the kind of liveliness um, that is necessary for people to want to inhabit a basement space. But the upper level, I think you can definitely see the the DNA of the 1970s festival marketplaces in there. But there's a public restroom in the basement for anyone. <laughs> and when you're in New York City, you have to have your little map just in case uh, you need to go of where, where you, there are public restrooms because there are, are, are few. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually think their restrooms are an important part of the argument for malls. Um, I did another interview earlier today in which I was asked about the history of mall work walkers, which I do talk about in the book, you know, like older people who use the mall for exercise. And one of the reasons the mall is so great for them is A, the climate control, kind of year-round walking, B, the, you know, smooth surfaces, you know, better than the sidewalks in many cities, C, plentiful bathrooms, and D, benches. And these are all things that in a perfect world um, cities themselves and, and pu true public spaces would provide, but we don't live in a perfect world. So in the meantime, the mall is really providing those things. So true. Um, okay, back to the questions. Um, get Jeff Gold is asking your view of malls and the attempts at suburban retrofits um, and, uh, you know, the age of climate change and what we should do with malls um, to avoid uh, or to reduce our impact on, on the climate. Yeah, um, I think as much as possible, we should be recycling the actual buildings of malls. Like the first, a lot of the first wave of mall retrofits involved demolishing the mall and, and building something new in that space. But I think now there are enough good examples, including the um, ACC Highland example that I showed you, of people putting new uses in the mall, reusing the concrete and steel. Um, that's really important. I also think, um, you know, malls tend to have too much parking lot, like their parking lot is made um, to kind of take the Black Friday crowd. So there's only one day a year when it's actually filled. And I think um, building more density into mall parking lots, uh, you know, could be a great way to get more housing in suburbs. Um, people often ask me, like, could we just turn malls into housing? And I don't think that kind of like one-to-one -one retrofit really works that well. Like malls just aren't a great um, place to like turn into housing, but I think their parking lots are a great opportunity where there you know, are already utility lines, are already parking spaces, already cleared land to build new housing and parking lots. Um, and a lot of the malls that are dying tend to be the ones that are older because they have not been updated. So they're in first ring and second ring suburbs that are much more dense than they were when the malls were built in the 60s and 70s, and so really need that kind of increasing densification, more apartments, um, which could help make them more walkable, more bikeable, et cetera. Yeah, no, I, I love that idea. And plus you're getting rid of um, concrete or, or blacktop. Right, right. And there are malls, I mean, there are a lot of malls that are actually built over wetlands or creeks because they were kind of, um, 
you know, lesser lots. And so like there are a lot of malls that have water problems. And so there are some malls that have gone, like continued to be retail establishments, but they've actually daylit the creeks in the middle of their parking lots so that they do not constantly have a sinkhole whenever it rains. So, I mean, yes, getting rid of asphalt um, and just a general, like thinking about bioswales and permeable pavements and all of these other things that are part of kind of, you know, classic like environmental talks, like all of that is very applicable to malls. <laughs> That's great. Um, another question uh, from Kelvin Dickinson. Hi, Kelvin. Um, people think the ideas of malls died due to online shopping. When do you think they started to go away? And is online shopping the only reason? Okay. This is like this is like the number one question everybody has. So online shopping is not the only reason. Um, I mean, malls were there was a downturn in malls in the 90s because the US began to be over mauled. Um, I can't remember the exact statistics, but the US has like way more shopping per capita than even, you know, like um, most European countries and just basically too many square feet of shopping for our population. So that started to create a problem for the mall industry in the 1990s. Um, that was then compounded by the rise of online shopping and the 2007 recession. So it's really like a three-part problem for malls. Um, and in some ways, the current mall die-off is kind of right-sizing the amount of retail we have for the population. Um, but it's interesting just in terms of online shopping specifically, before the pandemic, online shopping was only about 15% of retail. And I think most people would kind of assume it was much higher. And that zoomed up to 33% during the pandemic. But that number is already coming back down. Like when people had more of an option to shop in person, they started turning away from the amount of online shopping that they've been doing during the pandemic. So people definitely do not prefer to shop for everything online. Yeah. Um, there's another question I see Andrew um, Cronson is asking, how do you feel about the choice of the shops at Hudson Yards oh. catering to <laughs> high-end up upscale stores, um, shops selling Velbin goods, uh, only affordable by a select few? Um, I am just... For the record, I am anti Hudson Yards. I think Hudson Yards is a very bad mall. Um, I actually think the luxury part of it um, is not great, but malls have historically, you know, tried to have um, basically shops for every income level. And I think there are some shops at Hudson Yards that are lower price, but they're up really high and you have to travel through a lot of escalator and elevator to get to them. And so it's hard to even know that they're there. So I think the, the I think Hudson Yards' problem is more spatial than curatorial, but the curatorial part of it definitely doesn't help. Yeah, I've I, there is a, um, what's the, the Japanese gap? Uh, Unigo. Oh, yes. Very, very fond of Uniqlo, in fact, yes. Yeah, I mean, I actually think I bought some Uniqlo in that, yeah. yes. in that one. Right. So, like, Uniqlo, Muji are in there, but, like, would you know that when you were on the ground floor? No. And, like, one of the things that is really great about a suburban mall that's all on one floor is how browsable it is. That, like, things are actually not that far apart, and so... You know, you can walk past the luxury row and find the cheaper stores. I mean, even at, at North Park, the Dallas Mall that I mentioned, that um, you know, they, you know, they have a Neiman Marcus, and right outside the Neiman Marcus, there's a Tiffany and a Dolce and a Gabbana and like Tory Birch, like all these luxury stores. But it only takes you like 10 minutes to walk past that, you know, sort of like you would on Fifth Avenue and get to um, the mid-range department store and get to like the Athleta and, you know, other stores that are much more kind of middle-class oriented, shall we say. 
Um, so Hudson Yards, it's just like, it's so hard to get around. You can get stuck in the luxury zone um, where you know most of us are not gonna be purchasing anything. Do you think that's a good strategy for for malls of of doing that sort of layering of high end, low end, um, or just like I'm thinking about like putting a library or a post office, you know, yeah. other yeah. services as a means of getting people back to the mall and um, having that mixed use and and mixed environment of people who are who are in there. Yeah, I do. And honestly, most of the ongoing highly successful malls, like the mall at Short Hills, King of Prussia, like have that kind of high low thing happening. Like they have anchor department stores um, like Neiman Marcus or Saks, and they have Williams, Williams Sonoma and other kind of higher end shops. But then they also have a children's place or an old navy or you know, things where people are just gonna pick up a bunch of clothes for their kids. And they have a food court, which again generally has food at all price points. So you can get kind of, you know, like at all the LA malls, they have Din Tai Fung, which is like a, a dumpling chain. Um, but then you can also get more fast food things. So yeah, I think that kind of high low, something for everyone is really important for malls. Um, and that's what keeps people coming back and makes them accessible to even like the local community um, that may not you know, might be of different incomes, but like, we'll sometimes be running in for something cheap and sometimes running in for something expensive. Um, uh, I, I, I apologize if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly. Uh, Neal Cronin um, asks, what's your favorite mall? Oh, well, I think it's really, um, and you, you would know this if you read the book, it's really North Park in Dallas. Um, I could have shown a zillion more photos of North Park both then and now, but it's really a beautiful space. And I also just really love the story that it's still under family ownership. I mean, originally malls um, were more personal. Like so a lot of the family companies that started up malls originally owned, you know, three malls or 10 malls. And so that meant that like somebody had an eye on every aspect of them all the time. And I was lucky enough to walk around North Park with Nancy Nasher, who owes it, owns it now. And she basically like critiqued every store for me. Like I only put like a tiny amount of her critique in my book, but it was so amusing to go around with somebody who basically like grew up with the mall, had been in malls for 50 years. And she was like, oh, like, Outdoor Voices is really going to have a problem. Like they don't have enough merchandise in their store. And then like the week I got back, Outdoor Voices like um, fired their CEO and like brought in new people. And I was like, oh, okay. Like this is somebody who knows retail from the ground up. And so, and I think that's really necessary for successful malls. It doesn't have to be a family owner. It can just be a great manager, but there is a balance to them, a curation to them, an understanding of like competition and retail tenants and like what the correct mix is that I think really you have to you know pay attention to on the ground and that there's an art to that too. Yeah. Well I'm just keeping my eye on on the time and we're we're pretty much out of time. Uh, but I did um I don't think I uh Alexandra did you ever work in the mall? I did not work in the mall. Um, but I really, I have kind of, as, as I've been, you know, talking about my book, I have collected so many, I worked in the mall stories from people that I really hope that somebody um, can put together kind of like an I worked at the mall oral history, because I, I think just focusing on people's stories of working at the mall, like in and of itself as a separate book would be a great, great project. I mean, is it a book or is it a musical? Like this <laughs> So much drama, right? Like there's yeah. so much drama of the mall, the escalators and the fountain and uh, the ramps and all of these different groups of people. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the mall, like the mall atrium with a fountain at the center, like you can imagine that on a Broadway stage as a really spectacular set. So somebody just needs to write the plot to go with that set. I think that's gonna be you. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I need a next project. <laughs> oh, there's Kate. 
Well, while we're waiting for your Mall the Musical, um, <laughs> thank you so much for, for being here today. And before we wrap up, I would just love uh, your kind of like parting thoughts on like what the future of the vacant mall is. Like, what do you, what piece of advice do you give to communities who have this like big empty box? How do we make that usable? Because, you know, we're preservationists. We don't want buildings to come down. We want right. them to be community assets. I think it's really about figuring out what, I mean, it is about figuring out like what combination of public and private uses will serve your community best. Like there are actually a lot of great examples of public libraries going into malls. Um, so I think, you know, public libraries, you know, food court and spaces where people can hang out maybe with some like play area um, that's free, uh, you know, exercise rooms, co-working spaces, some retail, like just kind of trying to layer on these things, maybe in a way that they haven't been layered in the past, but that fits more closely to like what people are doing today and like, you know, what society is like in 2023, which is pretty different from what society was like in 1960. Awesome. All right. So well, we need to get to work. <laughs> yes. But I think yeah. it can be fun. I mean, I feel like like take that mall energy, like take those good memories and think, okay, like how would I, you know, where would I like to make good memories now? And can, can the mall be that space? Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you both so much. Liz, thank you so much for moderating this talk for us. Alexandra, thank you for writing this book and for being here today to talk about it. We are very excited to see what you do next. So. We'll look out for that. Um, and thank you all for joining us, for tuning in. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, this uh, talk was recorded. So if you want to find the recording, you can find it on our Facebook and YouTube channels. Um, and stay tuned for more great author talks coming up. Our next one is in March with Christina Wilson to talk about um, more mid-century modernism. So go to our website, see what we have coming up. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see you soon in another Zoom. Great. Thanks so much for having me and for the great audience. Thanks, yeah, everybody. It was, it was super fun. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.